You guys awake and alive? Good morning to our online family. Hey, the last few weeks uh, from Easter to last Sunday, we've been talking about change. We've been talking about how change is possible in your life no matter what the enemy may try to tell you in your head. Your life can change. And if you know the enemy like I do, he is a stinking liar. The truth is not in him. John 8 and 44 says, when he lies, he speaks in his native language, right? He does not speak in Espanol. He does not speak Brecken Sie Deutsch. I'm making all this up. He does not I don't know what other languages do I know. Uh, uh, I know a little bit of Japanese. Konnichiwa. Watashiwa nihongo hanaseimasen. That means I do not speak a lick of Japanese. <laughs> That's about it. His native tongue lies. And guess what? You may not realize this, but the enemy speaks to your mind every single day that you live. Every breath you breathe, the enemy is speaking into your mind. But the language he speaks is lies. His most common strategy, we believe, is to build up what we call strongholds. Strongholds, these are, these are lies that he places in your mind to try to hold you captive to your thoughts. You know, it's a fight. If you want your life to change, and it can change, you have to recognize, you have to realize starting right now that it's going to take a fight. But not just any kind of fight. It's not a physical fight. It's a spiritual fight. In the Word of God, strongholds uh, are pretty common. You can see them throughout Scripture. But strongholds can have two different purposes, and it's important in the context of today's message that you understand both. One purpose for a stronghold could be maybe if you are a prisoner and you are imprisoned within the walls of that stronghold. Or possibly, maybe you need the stronghold for protection from whatever is on the outside of those walls. Today, we're going to talk about the strategy, the number one strategy that the enemy brings to try to prevent you from all of the promises that God has for you, but he also wants to prevent you from accomplishing and living out the purpose that God has for you. So I hope you came ready to hear the word of God. I hope you came ready to be encouraged. I hope you came ready to change. We pray that you just come as you are, but we pray that when you leave, you leave different than the, way, than the way you came. We pray that you leave changed and transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when I think about strongholds, I think about a story in the Bible in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua. You can read about it in Joshua chapters 5 and 6. Some of you may have heard of it before, and that is Joshua and the battle of Jericho. Jericho was a fortified city with a wall or a stronghold that went all the way around it. And this wall was massive. It was like a wall big enough for chariots to have races on the top of the wall. Okay, so it was as wide probably as our road out there that you drove in on today. This was the city that after the children of Israel had been in the wilderness for 40 years, just wandering in circles. Why, you, you may ask? Because they did not believe the promises of God. You see, God had told them when they came out of the land of Egypt that he was taking them to the promised land. But when he sent the spies in to see the promised land, they came back and they said, hey, there's giants in that land. Like we are not gonna be able to take that land even though God said they could take that land. They listened instead to the lies of the enemy. It built up strongholds in their life. And God said that even when they begged God, now, now let us go, God said, no, this generation is going to die off. So imagine, if you will, an entire generation dies off. It's now their children who are young men and women, probably 17, 18, 19-year-olds who are getting ready to go in and possess the city of Jericho. It's the first city that they're going to take on their way to the promised land. But the city is completely encompassed with this massive wall. But God has a plan. Here's what you need to understand is this wall was literally keeping them and holding them back from the promise of God. That's what strongholds do. When the enemy begins to build them up one lie at a time, I want you to just imagine if I would have had a bunch of bricks and it's kind of funny, just like two weeks ago before Easter, we were doing like a massive cleanup, you know, here on campus just because, you know, things clutter collects. Anybody know that? 
Not at your house? Okay, just at ours. Okay. Well, here, outside of my office, they had cleaned up, like, in the ditch, and there were these really cool old bricks. And they were sitting beside, like, the steps leading up to my office, and they'd been there for a while. And Brad finally was like, I really wanted to keep them, but every day I was like, can we get rid of the bricks? Can we get rid of the bricks? And he was like, finally, we're cleaning up. And he goes, I guess you can trash the bricks. I'm like, score. So I told Ty, I was like, load those suckers in your truck and throw them away. Yesterday, I'm like, where'd we put the bricks? He was like, seriously. No, I'm like, you, I could have no, used said, them. You said, hey, I have a great illustration <laughs> idea, but I need some bricks. Do you know where I can get some? I'm like, yeah, and the trash. They're gone. But Told here's you what we needed happened. those. Imagine if I had these awesome bricks that were outside my office. I would stack them, but here's what happens. He tells you a lie, and he starts building this wall. And if you don't take that, that, that wall, if you don't take that lie and do something with it, we're going to teach you how in a minute. He just begins to stack those bricks, one lie after another, after another, after another, after another. And just like the wall of Jericho was separating the children of Israel from their promises, so the enemy wants to do that in your life. He wants you to build a wall. He wants you to build a stronghold in your mind, keeping you from all the good things that God says are yours. You see, even though the children of Israel had to go in and do the fighting, Seriously, it was supernatural. You see, when they began to walk around this wall, up on top of that wall, the enemy was on that wall and they were being taunted the entire time. Just imagine. These guys were slaves for over 400 years. That's what they were. The children of Israel were known as slaves. So they're down there walking around this mighty armies up on top. And they're literally like, hey, losers, why don't you go back out to the wilderness and eat some more manna? You know what I'm saying? Like, you're not taking this city anytime soon. And God had told them to walk around the wall and do no talking. Now, listen, he literally said, shut your mouth and walk around the wall seven times. How many of you would just be honest and say that would have been a struggle? Me and you, that's it. Okay, thank you for some honest people in the house. Okay, the fact is that would have been so hard, but God knew. God knew that they needed to just be quiet because if they engaged with the enemy, fear was going to grip their heart. No engagement with the enemy. You be quiet. You believe what I said. You believe what I said. I said you're going to take the city. You do exactly what I say and you'll take this city. Seven days, they march around that wall. And on the seventh day, seven times. And God said that last time, you're to shout. You're to shout with a voice of victory. I can't even imagine the sound that went up to the heavens when they shouted. And the walls, archaeology says that those walls didn't just crumble. Those walls went straight down as if a hand from heaven pushed the walls into the ground. You see the, this fight that we are fighting against the enemy, it's not one that's going to be fought with flesh and blood. It's not one that you're going to physically arm up and go out into battle. It is a spiritual battle, and you've got to learn how to fight spiritually because God will bring you victory, but he expects you to get in on it and do the work. So we're going to teach you how this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3, gives us an idea of what this looked like looks like. It says, we are human. Did you know that? You're human. I'm Some human. of you don't look like it, but that's Each okay. And every day. Well, that was really hurtful. Each and every day, we need to recognize we are human. Right. All right. What does this mean? It means that we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle, we call the mountains around here, that keep people from knowing that's having an intimate relationship with God. We capture, say capture. This is really important. Let's say it one more time. Capture. We capture every rebellious thought and we teach those thoughts to be obedient to Jesus. We capture every thought, every lie that comes from the enemy and makes it into our mind. We capture those thoughts and we teach those thoughts a lesson. We teach those thoughts to obey Jesus. A study was done not too long ago and it said that every day, in our mind, we have anywhere from 12 to 50,000 thoughts with maybe gusts up to 60 or 75, depending on your line of work. If you're a truck driver, I bet you have a lot of time to think while you're on the road. I love to drive and I love to think. How many thinkers do we have in the room? You just love to drive and think. You come up with your best ideas driving, that is me. But we have a lot of thoughts. That's tens of thousands of thoughts 
that come through our mind each and every day. But here's my question for you, the question I need to ask myself, is how many of those thoughts, what percentage of the thoughts that come through your mind each and every day are negative, lying thoughts that the enemy puts in your mind versus God-honoring thoughts that are true about you and about who you are through Christ and what God has for you? What would the proportion be from negative demonic lies from the enemy versus God honoring truths about you and from his word. What is the ratio? I can't answer that question for you. Only you really know what's going on in your heart and in your mind each and every day. But we need to begin to ask ourselves this question because truly at the end of the day, as you think, so you will be. We know this to be true. So, so let me give you some examples. Are you thinking to yourself, you know, maybe you gave your, your life to Christ on Easter. We had a lot of people, praise God, that gave their lives to Jesus on Easter a few weeks ago. And I know how the enemy is. Immediately when you say yes to Jesus, man, he just begins to hammer you with every sort of lie you could ever imagine. I, I can just only uh, imagine now in the last few weeks how many times the enemy has told you in your mind there's no way that you can live for God. There's just no way you're going to pull it off. You're not going to be consistent. You're not going to drag your ear out of bed. And you're, gonna, you're not going to get up early and make your way to church. You're not going to get the kids ready and get them to church. Are you, are you believing these things? Are, are, have you told? yourself that you've made too many mistakes? Have you told yourself that you're not good enough to be forgiven by God? You, 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 you look at your past and you look at the decisions that you've made and you just say to yourself, I just can't do it. Or are you leaning on God and saying, you know what, God, I'm not worthy of what Jesus has done for me, but by his blood, I am saved by the grace of almighty God. And you know what? I'm here. I'm humble. I'm broken, but I want to be whatever you've called me to be. And I'm just going to trust you one day at a time and believe that you're going to radically just save me and change me and, and let my feet step by step by step, day by day. Just try my very, very best to serve you. You know, you have to fill your mind with the truth of God's word. You have to cancel out the lies that fill your head. As I said, how you think will determine how you live. What you choose to meditate on will eventually manifest, right? We've heard the saying, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your character, and your character determines your destiny. We know this to be true. If you've been living long enough on this earth, you've found this to be true. I love Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says, be careful how you think. Good advice. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Think about this. Think about where you're at right now in your life. Think about where you live. Think about your career path. Think about where you go to church. Think about who you are married to. Think about your kids. Think about at everything right now where you're at you are where you are as a result of many 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 thoughts and decisions and behaviors where you're at right now in this season maybe even in this situation that you're dealing with right now you are where you are because of your thoughts i love pastor craig groschel life church he says this your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thought Your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thought. Think about that. Think about that. I mean, we can make this so practical. If if I want to lose 20 pounds, right, and that's all I meditate on, that's all I think about, right, and I just just make that my top priority, I make it my main focus, I'm probably going to lose 20 pounds because I am dedicated and committed in my mind to doing it. You think, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual. This is the way God wired us. This is the way God created us. Proverbs 23 and 7 says, For as a person thinks, so are they. So is he. So is she. However you think, that is what will be. God created us this way. And Paul knew this. The apostle Paul knew this. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, he says, We capture. Remember? We capture. Say that with me. We capture those rebellious thoughts, and we teach those thoughts to obey Christ. How many of you guys have ever been uh, in uh, police work, military, anything like that, where you've had to apprehend someone, right? 
How, how many of you would agree if you have to apprehend somebody that you probably need to be pretty assertive and pretty aggressive about it? Otherwise, they might uh, get away or they might whip you, right? You probably need to, you can't, you can't just go halfway about any of it. You really just have to be all in and you have to really be fully committed to make sure that you apprehend, that you capture the person that you're going after, right? We have a story about capture, don't we, honey? We do. Do you remember Easter? I do. I how many years ago was it? The, kid, the kids were about yay tall, thinking maybe yeah. 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there. Maybe. Probably five, six, seven years ago, we were in the old sanctuary, and Brad and I had this great idea for Easter. We wanted to have a pure white lamb. Like, we wanted a live illustration. We were going to sacrifice them on Easter morning. Just kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> oh, that was a joke. That was <laughs> funny. <laughs> okay. So we didn't oh, own, boy. we didn't, somebody's face is like, just kidding. We do not sacrifice animals here. Okay. So we wanted this white lamb as an illustration, but we didn't own any lambs. And so we were seriously praying like God cares about the little things. We love bring the, bringing the word of God to life. We like having fun in church. We want to teach you in a, in a creative yeah. way. And so we were like, like some God, bricks today would have been really nice. It would have been so good. <laughs> I'm just saying. It would have made the I'm whole message. I'm not a hoarder. Message. I throw things now away. Now it stinks. So... We were like, God, we need a white lamb. Brad at that time was driving a bus for the Grove School. And so he was out on a bus route one day, driving down a dirt road. And he sees up on the hillside, these lambs. Somebody had, was like raising them. And he looked and there was this little white lamb up in the bushes. And so he calls me up on the phone. He was like, you won't believe it. I didn't call you right then. You didn't call me? Not right that second. I was okay. driving a bus, but I True. did, but I did, slam, but I did slam on the brakes and, and there's kid fell on the aisle. And I said, what are you standing up for? That's why you're supposed to sit down. Okay. But when I got true. off the bus at the barn, I That's gave you a call and okay. I said, guess what I found? So Brad's like, Misty, I found a lamb. And I'm like, do you know who owns it? He was like, no, but what's that matter? And I'm like, I don't know. It's a tiny Worst little thing, thing no. right? So he comes home. He's like, get in the car. Let's go over there and ask him. So, of course, I send Brad to the door because Brad is the extrovert. Brad can sell anything to anybody. He can convince people. So he knocks on the door. This guy comes, and we kind of give him our spiel as to why he needs to help Jesus on Easter with the lamb this year. And the guy is a little bit apprehensive. He doesn't know us from Adam. We don't necessarily look like farmers that can take well, care of his lamb. And this was his but, prize lamb. And like, this he was. was he he yeah. loved this little lamb. He loved this lamb. Okay. And so we begged the guy. Just honestly, we just begged him. And he finally promise agreed. We won't let anything happen to it. We promise. Promise. Nothing will happen to it. We Nothing. will take great care of it. We've got a 10 by 10 kennel. It's secure. We'll take it on Sunday morning. We'll bring it right back to you on Monday. Okay? Well, there was a little hiccup in that plan called the Helton children. So at that time, <laughs> we have four kids and they're all really close in age. A couple of years of like two and a half years, we had four kids. And so they just thought this was amazing. They came home from school on like Friday night and they saw the little lamb and Brad and I went out there with them and we pet the lamb. We're like, it's so awesome. You know, then we went back in the house. It was getting almost dark. We go in the house and in just a little bit, one of those children, I'm not going to say who, cause I don't really remember, but Tyler, Tyler. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Went back out and he's thinking nothing could happen. And he unlatches the little door and thought he would play with the little lamb, but the little lamb got scared and just took off, just took off. And so we look out the window, I see the lamb and I'm like, oh my gosh, Brad! Bloody murder, thought somebody was dead. Yes. I'm like, get outside. And so all of us, okay, you got to know how intense the Helton family is, but we are outside on the hill because we kind of live up on the hillside and we are screaming, get the lamb! Face paint, brave heart mode, right? <laughs> We Catch had, the lamb. We had promised this we guy. We promised him. Brad That's why I, you don't make promises, guys. Oh, my goodness. You just I don't know. If I bring the lamb back to you, good. <laughs> if I don't, hey, it's 50-50 chance, man. So the stupid little lamb, I mean, he is darting this way that and this way. Quick. And listen, you got to understand where we live, okay? On this side is the lake. You go through the woods, and it's a straight Drops down off. drop, okay? Bluff. It's a cliff. It's a bluff. bluff. On the other side is the pasture, and we own horses, okay? So the little lamb goes this way, and one of the kids dive after him and yes. cuts him off from the woods. He goes this way. He gets into the pasture, and the horses are like, rearing up, and we're like, no! Everybody is just diving. Finally, it was, my heart is racing.
thinking right now, I just am reliving this. I thought this. the lamb was going to die of a heart attack. Oh, my gosh. He was just starting everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. That's not a very good lamb sound. <laughs> That's like a duck. Well, then do it. <laughs> I heard you, eh, Let's eh, hear it. Uh, what do I you got? It. You got something better? I already better? did it once. Let me hear it. Well, now it might be That bad. was in first service. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Much better. Good job. Rant, rant. It's a lamb in distress, okay? Okay, there you go. <laughs> Finally, one of our kids, I mean, we are screaming. I can only imagine. At this point, it's pitch black. It is dark. We are screaming. The neighbors, which are down in this little resort area, they thought they like came here to retire in the peace, and then oh. the Heltons are up on the top of the hill. Not living next to us. We're yelling. <laughs> one of them finally, like literally, it goes to dark for the woods one more time, and I don't know who jumped, but somebody jumped and like landed right on this baby lamb and grabbed it. They captured it. We threw it back in. Well, we didn't throw it. We laid it back in that kennel. We shut the door. We locked it. We padlocked it. We were like, don't touch that gate ever again. But I'm telling you, that night we understood the word capture because we truly, we were like, there's no way we're going back to this guy and telling him his lamb went off the cliff to its death at our house, right? We're not going to go back and tell him we didn't have it. Failure just wasn't an option. And this is the same thing that we have to do when it comes to thoughts that the enemy places in our mind that are contrary to the truth of God's word or what God says about right. you. You've got to be vigilant. You have to be serious. You have, right. to, you, have to, you, just to, you have to persevere through it all and push forward yes. constantly, continually until you what? Capture, apprehend, capture those negative thoughts. Those are rebellious thoughts. These are thoughts that are contrary to what God says. So you have to capture them. You have to apprehend them and then teach them. This is what God's word says. What you're putting in my mind, Satan, what you're telling me about my marriage, that it's not going to make it, that's not true. God says, God says that, we're, that we've overcome by the blood of the lamb. And, 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 and when you look in God's word, we're more than conquerors, right? In Christ Jesus, there's promise after promise after promise that tells us that we can when the enemy says that we can't. It's just absolutely not true. But you know, it's important that we understand the word of God. Otherwise, we're not going to know how to fight the fight. That's right. So if we're going to capture those rebellious thoughts and we are going to pull down the strongholds, really what you want to know today is how. Just say how. Okay, now I can tell you, because that's really what it comes down to. We're going to come to church. We're not just going to hype you up. We want you to walk away practically. How do I do this? Because, guys, every single day, the enemy is trying to build those strongholds by putting lies in your mind, all right? So here's how we do it. We're going to do an illustration before I tell you this first one. So I want you right now in your mind, not out loud, to count to 10. Go. Now say your name out loud. When you said your name, did you realize you had to stop counting? You know why? Because the spoken word is more powerful than the silent thoughts. The spoken word is more powerful than the silent thoughts. The first way that you are going to demolish the strongholds that the enemy is building up in your mind is by the spoken word word. What spoken word? The spoken word of God. The Bible says there is power of life and death in your tongue. There's power in our words and not just our thoughts, guys. Our thoughts are powerful, but when your thoughts are running amok, you need to speak, verbally speak. I cannot tell you how many believers are like, well, I don't pray out loud. I don't, you know, I'm just a really shy person. Listen, you have got to get aggressive like we had to get with the little lamb, okay? When the enemy is trying to destroy your life, you need to know the word of God and you got to speak it out loud to demolish those thoughts, those lies. That I am an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of of my testimony. You can go to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter four, and we see this story where Jesus is led by the spirit into the wilderness. And the Bible says that he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And while he is there, the enemy shows up on the scene. Of course he does because Jesus is weak physically. The enemy shows up and he begins to tempt him. As he begins to tempt him and as he begins to speak lies to Jesus, do you know how Jesus counteracts them? He says this, Satan, it is written. And then he quotes the word of God. 
If you are going to demolish the lies, you're going to pull down the strongholds. And some of you guys, these strongholds have been there a long time. The enemy's just been brick after brick after brick after brick. You are going to demolish them when you begin to speak the word of God over them out loud. But the second thing comes right after that, and that is this. In order to speak the word, you've got to know the word. The reason we have so many believers that are living with these strongholds in their life is simply this. You don't know the word. You don't know the word. You haven't hidden it in your heart. And I realize, man, that's a lot of word to know. But here's what I want to tell you you've got to do. You have got to find scriptures that line up with the thoughts that the enemy keeps reoccurring, putting in your head. All right? I'm going to tell you a really quick story. When Brad and I got married about almost 22 years ago, we were in college. We were so excited. We were like 23, 25. We weren't even that young. And we, we were so in love. We thought we were in ministry. We knew exactly what God had called us to do. We got married, and all of a sudden, we began to have nothing but fights. We thought we had married the wrong person. Anybody ever been there? Do not raise your hand. That was a joke. Okay, you'll get one of these. Well, we did, honestly. But here was what, here was what we had agreed on before we ever got married. Divorce is not an option. Failure is not an option. We considered the D word to be a cuss word in our home. We would not. We refused to say it. So from day one, we made an agreement. We won't say divorce. It's not an option. Not even joking. We knew that there would be tough days ahead. We didn't realize how tough, right? Because I didn't realize that Brad would be so difficult to live with. And I was an angel. But <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Okay. We're joking, but the enemy started lying. (laughs) I don't need that anyway. The enemy just started lying in our minds. And even though we weren't saying, we weren't saying things like, I hate you. We weren't saying things like I want a divorce. We weren't saying it. Guess what the enemy was filling our heads with? This isn't going to work. This is, God is not going to restore this. You might as well call it quits. You might as well throw in the towel. Are you really going to be miserable? And I mean, we had, by the time this went on for about three years and we had AJ and Ty. And so stress was mounted and guys, we were in ministry. So every Sunday we're going to church, we're leading people in worship and going home and we love each other one minute, 10 minutes later, we want to kill each other. Okay. Finally, we realized (laughs) you love his sound effects, right? You realize that failure is not an option. We got to figure this thing out, okay? And so we took the word of God and we looked up tons of scriptures that applied to us in that moment, okay? Like things like, um, you know, listen more than you speak, things like that that I needed to hear. We printed them and we began to hang them all over the house. I'm not even kidding. We couldn't afford to go and buy pretty ones. So every cabinet door that you opened, there were scriptures. You go into the bathroom above the toilet, there were three. You go into our bedroom above our bed, there were scriptures. Every place in our home. Why? Because we had to reprogram our brain to say failure's not an option. This is going to work. God put us together. We love each other, but we got to figure out how to do life together. And guess what? The enemy was trying to build up strongholds because he did not want us to come here and plant this church that would impact your life and your friends and win people for Jesus. Had Brad and I not stayed together, this would never have been. Yesterday, we were at, I was at a shower and this lady came up to me and she was telling me, she said, hey, I met somebody that knows you. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. She said, I told him where I went to church and he said, who's the pastors out there? And she said, Brad and Misty Helton. And he said, really? I went to college with them. And I was like, yeah. And she said, as soon as I said it, he said, are they still together? <laughs> and I was like, he, we, nobody knew we struggled. Nobody knew we struggled because we put on a real good front. Nobody realized. But I thought it was so funny because the fact is when the push, when, the, when it gets really tough, most people just throw in the towel. But here's what I want you to understand today is you don't have to throw in the towel. You do not have to remain addicted if you're addicted today and the enemy keeps lying to you. You do not have to keep going back to the same habitual sins. You do not have to say in your marriage, you know what, it's never going to work. What you need to do is say failure is not an option. You need to get into the word of God. You need to begin to Google whatever you're struggling with. You need to Google scriptures on that. You need to write them out or print them out. You need to put them up in front of your face. You need to hide them in your heart so that when the enemy comes against you, you begin to speak out the word of God over that. When he says you can't, you said, I can't, God can through.
through me in Jesus' name over and over and over. And you will demolish those strongholds. Amen. We have to take captive those thoughts today. Right. We have to recognize that the battle is not physical, it's spiritual. It's in your mind. But if you can win the war in your mind, your life will change. It can change beginning right now. We've been pastoring a long time, and we've just seen it over and over and over and over and over again. We've seen so many people's lives change. We've seen marriages change. We've seen people live for God that when they walk through the door, you would just think to yourself, this is going to be tough. This is going to be tough. But we've seen people just completely turn their lives around. We've seen people become much better parents because they decided to go to the word of God and lean on his word. We've seen so much success. Why? Because God's word is our success. Yeah understanding, hearing the word of God, applying the word of God, speaking the word of God, thinking the word of God with every situation against every thought, taking those thoughts captive, canceling out those lies with the truth of God's word. How many of you guys are ready to do that in your life today? Amen. The enemy hates you. He hates God's promises. He does not want you to experience God's promises. He does not want you to experience the purpose for which you were created on this earth. And he will do everything within his power to keep you from what God has for you. But you're bigger than that. You're better than that because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let's pray today. Father, we are so grateful. As I see these people across this room, God, and I know there's so many joining us online today, God, I know that there are many of us, God, that are in a very, very tough season right now. I know that the enemy has put so many lies in our heads. I know that the fight is fierce. God, the battle is real and it's hard. But Father, I pray today, right now in this very moment. God, let this be the game-changing moment right now for someone's marriage. Let this be the game-changing moment right now as someone battles against addiction with drugs or alcohol or pornography. Let this be the game-changing moment, Father God, where someone right now just begins to choose to trust you through their finances rather than struggling, God, without your provision and your protection. The enemy wants to lie to us. He wants to tell us so many things, God, that are not true. But your word is true. And, who, and, and when we receive your truth, your truth sets us free. So today, Father God, I speak freedom over all of your people right now through the word of God. I pray, Lord, that you would put a hunger in all of our hearts to hear your word, to read your word, to know your word, to think your word, to speak your word. It's the word of God that is living and active and powerful. It changes things. We thank you for your word today, Father. We thank you, Lord, that our lives can change. Strongholds can be broken because you are God and there is no one like you. We believe it today. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask you a very important question today, whether you're watching online or you're in this room, and that is, have you made Jesus the Savior of your life? Maybe the enemy has been telling you that you don't need God, but I'm here today to tell you that the truth is that without him, we perish in our sins. Sin leads to death, and death without Christ leads to a horrible eternity of judgment. And I would pray today that you would know him the way I have come to know him and that you would be set free and that you would experience hope and peace and joy and fulfillment. That you would know him in a real way and make heaven your home. So if you'd like to make that decision, it's really just a matter of asking God to forgive you of your sins because we're all sinners. And we need God to forgive us of our sins and, and wipe our slate clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only through him. It's only through Jesus that we can be saved. It's because of his blood and through his resurrection that we can be saved. It's about confessing him to be Lord of our lives. And so if you'd like to make that decision today, no one's looking around, but I just want to know who I'm praying with and who I'm praying for. So if you're in this room, would you just raise your hand at this time? If that's you, come on. If that's you, just raise your hand up right now. Thank you. I see your hand over to my left. Three people over to my left. People gave their lives to Christ last service. If you're watching online, you say, just comment all in in the comment section below. 
If you're watching on any of our platforms, go ahead and comment now. Let us know that you're making that decision. Anybody else today before we pray as a church family? Thank you. I see your hand on my right. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. God, thank you for these that are changing their eternal address. God, they're saying yes to Jesus. They're saying yes to heaven. Their lives will never be the same again. Church family, let's pray this prayer with all of those that have made this incredible life-changing decision today. Father, forgive me of my sins today. Wipe my slate clean with the blood of Jesus. I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the Son of God. It is only through Him I can be saved. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in Him. I thank you for him. Set me free today in my mind by the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.